younger kids and stuff like that. Today for middle school kids, we will be uh, packing up at 1.30, just back here behind the building uh, where the vans are. So if you can uh, be back there and be packed up and ready to roll with us, it'll be good as we get ready to uh, launch out for another week. And uh, one other thing um, for middle school students, high school students will be going to uh, CIY move later uh, this summer. Middle school students, uh, we're prepared and, and have got our deposits in for a, uh, a trip that uh, is by Christ and Youth. It's called Mix. It's for uh, going into sixth grade and through eighth graders, and we'll be going over to Salem Springs, Arkansas. And I'll put some more information out there because we're really, we're really needing to get commitments there uh, for those age groups if we're going to do that particular trip. And I'm going to help get some information out there this week that maybe help just explain what exactly that is, because I don't know if there's been a good communication line from middle schoolers to parents, which doesn't surprise me, okay? And so we're going to help make sure that that information gets out there and you can understand exactly what's going on with that. Church, good to see you this morning. It is so good to see you, church. Let's stand and let's sing some praises together this morning.
church. Amen. We learned a new song out of camp this week, and I uh, want to share it with you this morning. It's called Holy Spirit Come, and it's just a song inviting the Spirit in. And so as you read these words, uh, maybe you've heard this before, just sing this to God and just uh, sing it with your heart.
Thank you for Jesus and the cross and the resurrection and the hope that we have through him. It's in his name I pray. Amen.
right, good morning everyone. I'm Jamie Regis, one of the ministers here. If you're visiting with us today, hope to see you again sometime really, really soon. Um, At this time, our first through third grade can go to Children's Church, first through third grade. All right, very good. It is camp season, folks. We are off and running. High school camp was last week, middle school camps this week, followed that by 5-6 camp. One of the things I really enjoy uh, about about camp is, is, is the worship. Um, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty fun because usually we go out and visit maybe a night if I'm not out there helping with the week. And, um, I just, I always really enjoy seeing, um, young people, um, pour out their hearts before the Lord. It's something about doing it in an open chapel, you know, in a, in a beautiful place and, and, um, you know, and mosquitoes are around and it's, you know, 98 degrees with 115% humidity. It's, um, and campers don't sweat. I didn't know if you realize that or not. They don't. Anyway, it's really, really good, and I, I, I pray not only you parents, but the rest of you as well, because all of you here are a part of sending young people to camp. The church um, supports that kind of half-off coupon. That's not like a coupon we get from the camp. We pay for that, all right? And um, so, so you are all a part of, of getting those young people out there, and uh, uh, big, big changes many, many times happening in their lives, and um, it's just good stuff, really, really good stuff. All right, let's jump in. We are in Acts chapter 7. Acts 7. We are right at, today we'll wrap up a quarter of the way through this journey through Acts. Um, that's a good thing. Last week, last week we looked, today we're looking at, at the conclusion of what we kind of studied through last week. Last week we looked like 53 verses, and my goodness, I appreciate so much your patience last week because I knew it was going to take a little while. Today, today Seven verses, so it'll just be a, just be a little bit different. But it's, it's not just a conclusion; it is um, a conclusion, a, a chaotic conclusion, um, a conclusion with the wrong perspective that could be seen as quite tragic. Um, but we're going to see something today. And keep in mind, the Book of Acts is the history book of the New Testament. It's not teaching that is written by one of the apostles or something. This is action taking place. Now we can learn a lot from it. But, um, but it is history. So when I relay this to you today and we take a look at it, we, we are not talking about a story here. We're talking about an account, a report of something that took place. So um, again, we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 7. We'll begin right near the end, about verse 54. As I read from God's Word today, what I'll be reading from as well will be on the screen behind me, or behind me will be from the New American Standard Version of the Bible. If that's different than what you have in a hard copy version, it's perfectly fine. A lot of good versions of the Bible. Just want to make sure you're aware of that. So if it looks a little different to you, there's, there's a reason for that. Let's ask God to be right in the middle of this with us, and um, we'll jump into it. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you, Lord, for... Um, for your faithfulness to your people. Life, um, Father, can, can get kind of difficult at times. There are people in this room who can attest to that. And we pray in those times, Father, where there it be because of just um, the world can be kind of rotten sometimes or whether it be because of, of opposition to the truth found in Christ Jesus that, that arises on occasion. Um, we pray that we would... Um, No, you are faithful in the midst of all of that. We pray, Father, that we would learn from the example of those in your church when it first started so many years ago. Today, specifically, Stephen and his courage, his confidence, Lord. We pray that we will be challenged by it. We pray, Father, if change needs to take place in our lives, if if, if we need to burn more brightly for you, Lord, in our homes or in our place of work or wherever we might go, we pray, Father, that that you would convict us of that and you would bring the change in our lives by your spirit that needs to be put there. Guide our study, guide our thoughts, and open us for your word, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, adversity... Adversity is as old as sin, and I'm not, not just using that as a phrase, hyperbole, it's literal. Adversity is as old as sin, literally. Um, 
the failure of Adam and Eve in the garden so many years ago, millenniums ago, ensured the existence of difficulty and opposition in this world to the people of God. That is the nature of it. And the question for us, of those of us who are believers in Christ Jesus, followers of Christ Jesus, the question for us isn't whether we will be opposed, It isn't whether we will experience trouble. It isn't whether we will be persecuted. The question is, how will we respond when all of this takes place in our lives? The majority of chapter 7 of Acts is Stephen. He was just a man within the church. I guess you could give him the the place of deacon. He was was a table server within the church. Um, But he was not an apostle. He was still used of God. And he was on trial before the Sanhedrin. As we spoke about the past couple of weeks, the the Sanhedrin was was kind of the Jewish high court, the the religious supreme court of the day, and they did have a, a high level of authority. And he gave his defense before them as we looked at last week, and that defense was a powerful survey of his history and the history of his accusers because they were all Jews. And he took them all the way back to Father Abraham and marched right down through history to Jesus, showing them that Jesus is the fulfillment of everything that was spoken to the prophets and to to the fathers in the Old Testament. And along the way of this historical survey, he threw some pretty powerful punches at his accusers. And kind of interestingly enough, even though he was the one on trial, he kind of put them He kind of put them on trial. These are the types of words he used as he concluded his sermon. He used words like this, you stiff-necked people, you stubborn people, you uncircumcised in heart. Now, that might sound a little strange to us, but to his accusers, that's fighting words, okay? He called them betrayers, murderers, lawbreakers. And as you can imagine, this, this, was, this was building. This, this volcano was about to erupt. And when this takes place, I want us to notice the difference between, in this scene that we're going to look at, the difference between calm and chaos. Okay. My, my family, for some time, has been, has been a drag racing family. Uh, my dad started drag racing back when I was in, in high school many years ago. I even did a little bit of it way, way back when. Um, and my brother and my dad both still, uh, my brother's got a 78 Chevy Love that he races, and my dad has a 70 Camaro that he races. And they race a lot over at Mocan. Smoking Mocan Dragway over between Pittsburgh and Joplin. And um, anyway, they've been going there for years. But if, if, if you're familiar with that in any way whatsoever, you will know that, that on Memorial Day and Labor Day, they have big races. Um, it's big payout money races, so a lot of people show up for them. And if you want a good spot for the race on Saturday and Sunday, you've got to get there Friday night. So, so a couple of weeks ago, my dad and my brother showed up on Friday night. Um, Audrey, our youngest, and myself, we were planning on going and watching because one of her best, friend, all, best friends also drag races over there, runs a junior drag, dragster over there. Um, and so we've we got all this plan, big plans for the next day. Well, that Friday night, um, my dad's car is pretty consistent, runs pretty good. He usually doesn't have to test it very much, so it's still on the trailer. My brother's truck, whole different story, all right? seems like there's always something going on with that old truck. So he's, he's getting some test runs and stuff, and he had just gotten up, made a test run, didn't run good, okay? And dad was going back. They were parked by one another in the pit area, and he was going back, and my dad's just turned 76 years old. He doesn't like walking anymore, so he's on a bicycle. So he's riding his bicycle back, and it's about a quarter mile away from the, starting, from the starting line to where he was at. He's riding his bicycle. He noticed there was a woman, a woman that he recognized, a family had been there for years, coming towards him, walking a big German shepherd um, on, a, on a leash. And um, as they get closer, uh, Dad, I mean, the German shepherd's not like right by her. It's like out there a little ways. He's like, this dog's going to get in front of me. Usually if you run into a dog on your bicycle, the dog isn't the one who gets hurt, 
right. That's just kind of the way it happened. So dad's like, I don't want to wreck here. So, so he just stopped his bicycle, leaned over on his, his left leg, and that dog came up, dad thinking probably just to sniff him or something. Well, the dog latched on to his leg right below his knee onto his calf and um, had two puncture wounds almost two inches long in the back and in the front about an inch and a half long puncture wounds um, that went all the way to the bone. All right. Um, Dad ended up in the emergency room until about 11.30 that night. We didn't go watch him race. The next day, the doctor said, you got to keep this elevated for, for a few days. It was quite a scene from what I understand. And throughout it all, talking to my dad about it, he said, you know what's weird? He said, it didn't really even hurt. And he said, I don't know why, but he said, I never really got upset. He said, I've never raised my voice or anything. Let me tell you something. If I had been there and witnessed this, it would not have been pretty. All right, there probably would have been more than one person bitten, and I probably would have broke my foot in that dog's ribs. All right, I mean, there is no way I could have stood there and just watched this take place. I am very, very confident that if I was there, the way I would have responded, and my brother the same. It's a good thing he was in his truck coming back to the pitter because he, no telling what he would have done. All right, um, I'm, I'm quite certain we would have made matters a lot worse, okay? Now, here's my dad, completely calm in the midst of all of it. Calm in the midst. I would call that chaotic. I haven't been bitten by, I mean, I've been nipped by a dog, but a little poodle terrier thing, get off me, you know, but we're talking to German Shepherd here, all right? I want you to notice something as we look at this response today. As we see the conclusion of Stephen's sermon, and how the people respond to it. I want you to notice the polar opposite responses that take place. All right, verse 54 of Acts 7. Stephen has just summarized, or just concluded, I should say, his sermon, as we looked at last week. And he, he ends, he ends with a couple haymakers, all right? And then he says, The text says this, it says, now when they, the Sanhedrin, his accusers, when they heard this, they were cut to the quick and they began gnashing their teeth at him. Okay, cut to the quick. We've seen that phrase in the Greek already used one occasion in the book of Acts. And what what it means is this, I mean, literally the picture painted in the Greek is a picture of being sawn in two. I mean, we are talking a level of rage here that, that, that his accusers are undone by the rage. And then it goes on beyond that. It says they gnashed their teeth at them. Now, I, I'll, I'll be straight with you. I was told by, by my dentist, I'm talking a long time ago, all right, a long time ago, that, that at that point in time, I had the bottom teeth of like a 67, 68-year-old man, all right? I was like in my early 30s because I grind my teeth at night. So I got to wear a bite plate at night to keep that from happening. These people are so angry that they are clenching their jaw so tightly that their teeth are grinding, okay? They are furious. The picture painted by Luke, who's a doctor, by the way, he, he knows what these terms mean. The picture painted by, and on a side note, who helps him paint that picture with the words that he used, we'll talk about who helps him with that a little bit later. But the picture painted by Luke here is not a pretty one. This is not the kind of crowd that is going to behave behave naturally, behave, well, they are going to behave naturally. They're not going to behave rationally, all right? And I want you to compare how they respond to how Stephen responds to their outburst and their anger. So let's transition to Stephen, verse 55. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he, Stephen, gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So we got these guys, these religious leaders, losing it. They are so furious. 
And on the other side, we have Stephen as calm as a mountain valley lake on a still morning, all right? There's more to this picture, though, than just this this outer calmness of Stephen. He uses a term here, a title, I should say, that we don't see much in the New Testament. And the title is this. Look, look at the verses. He uses this in describing what he sees. He looked into heaven. He describes what he sees. And he sees the Son of Man. This is the last time in all of the New Testament that we'll see this title for Jesus used. Now, some of you Bible scholars say, well, wait a minute, preacher, what about Revelation? The Apostle John, who wrote Revelation, that ends our New Testament. It talks about the Son of Man, but look closely. It doesn't say the Son of Man. It says one like the Son of Man. The one like a Son of Man. This is a title. You know the only other person who used this title when it came to Jesus, referring to him in this way? Jesus himself. Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. We need to look a little bit more deeply into this title that Stephen used, because it is rare. Why did he use it? Is there something more going on here than than? meets the eye. So let's take a look at this. First of all, Stephen evidently and correctly saw Jesus as more than a Jewish Messiah. Understand this at this point. This is before Gentiles have become a part of anything. All the believers in Jesus up to this point in time, and we're only going on months, you know, quite a few months now, but they're all Jews, okay? But when we see the Old Testament, we'll see it specifically here in just a moment, and we see this terminology of son of man, we see that it is talking about a place of authority that is over everything and everyone. So he's saying, I see the one who is the head of nations, the one who is over all peoples, the one who is over all galaxies, the one who is thrown over all of creation. So first of all, Stephen sees Jesus in his rightful place. And his authority in a true and a real way. Secondly, the presence of the Messiah at the right hand of the Father. God the Father. There's something we got to understand about this. Stephen is here. He's on trial because his accusers say that he's blaspheming God because he's not, saying, he's not giving the temple its proper place of, of importance and authority. That's the reason he's on trial here, and they're labeling that as blasphemy. And the picture he's painting here is of the Messiah at the right hand of God. Okay? Now think about this for just a moment. Who's Messiah? His Messiah. And the potential Messiah of even his accusers there. We'll find out more about that here in just a second. And he is at the right hand of God. This is so much more powerful, so much more heart satisfying than going and making sacrifices in a temple, trying to atone for what you've done before God. Stephen says, I see my Messiah. And he's at the right hand of God. Number three, this is the ultimate fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. That's that prophet in the Old Testament I was referring to. The prophet that is quoted in Revelation. So let's take a look at it. This is, you keep a finger there in, in Acts chapter 7. We'll make it easy for you. Turn back to Daniel chapter 7. Look, Daniel's not a real, real big book, but Ezekiel is, and it's right next to the book of, the book of Daniel, the prophecy of Daniel is right next to it. So I'm going to try to do this. I should have marked it. My goodness, I don't want to lose my spot over there. All right. Daniel, chapter 7. One thing about Daniel that is, I mean, of of all of the prophets in the Old Testament, my goodness, Daniel is like the vision guy. It's like he he saw visions that had to do with world history. He saw visions about the rise of Alexander the Great. He saw visions about the rise of Rome, who's in power at that time. I mean, this guy saw some amazing visions. Of all those visions he saw, nothing held a candle to this, though. 
Daniel 7, verse 13, says this. Daniel speaking, I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming, and he came up to the ancient of days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations, men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which will not pass away, and his kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. Now, a lot of people want to take that, take that right over to Revelation and say, that's what's coming. Guys, that's already happened. Jesus has taken his rightful place at the right hand of God. He is in rule authority over everything. Now, not everything might acknowledge it yet. That's still coming. But he is in that place of power, whether they know it or not. And what Stephen is saying here to these, to these religious scholars of the Jews that like, Jesus is doing this right now. The Son of Man is in that place. He has fulfilled Daniel's prophecy. He is the one. Jesus' fulfillment of Daniel's vision shows that there was no place for any institution that gave religious privilege to one nation in particular. He's saying this, the time of the temple, it's over. It's over. And if they weren't already angry, which they are, I mean... This is like, can you boil water even more? I mean, seriously, once it starts boiling, can you really boil it? Because, man, they call, look what happens next. I mean, they know what he's saying here. Now, here's the other thing about what Stephen sees when he looks up. He sees the Son of Man at the right hand of God. What's the Son of Man's posture? So often, you see he took his seat at the right hand of God, meaning the throne, the place of authority. But here, the Son of Man is standing. Now, we need to understand something about this. Okay. The nation, for quite a little while, was captivated with a little trial going on. You know what I'm talking about? Between a man and a woman. This whole trial thing, and it was on the news like crazy. It's like, do I have to hear about Jack Sparrow anymore? Are you serious? And I, I love Robbie when you dress up as Jack Sparrow, but my goodness. All right. I mean, that's like dominating the news. I'm like, seriously, is there more important things to think about right now than this? Okay. Um, and when you would see, and, and that's the way we do it these days, when you're in a, in a play, in a courtroom, maybe some of you have been there before, when you take the place of a witness and you take the witness stand, what do you do? You walk up, you come up front, put your hand on the Bible, and then you go and do what? You sit. That's not the way it was then. At that point in time, when you came before the court to give your witness, you stood. The, the court, now they sat, but you stood and you gave your witness. Now, let's think about this for just a moment. Once again, what is the Son of Man doing? He's standing. So what we have taking place here is we have Stephen, who has been confessing Christ before his opposition. What is Jesus doing? Christ is confessing his servant before his father. Standing. Brothers and sisters, make no mistake about it. You take a stand for Jesus in this world, your Lord and Savior knows it, and he takes notice. It's no wonder Stephen's face shone like that of an angel throughout this entire chaotic scene. I mean, we got that quite a few verses ago, that when they looked at Stephen, he had this face of an angel. I told you for a couple weeks now, that's not the precious moments, chubby little thing face we're talking about here. We're talking about a man, confident, eyes on fire for the Lord. A man in the midst of chaos, and yet he is completely, totally, 100% in control of himself, and to be honest with you, of the situation. Now, on the other side, let's see what's taking place. Verse 57. Yeah, they caught this son of man thing and what it meant. Verse 57. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears. Moms, dads, you ever seen that take place before? You know what that's called? A royal fit. All right? 
Matter of fact, I am not only going to cover my ears so I can no longer hear you, I'm going to yell at the top of my lungs as well so that doubly I can't hear what you're saying anymore, all right? But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. Okay. Now, if you are a student of history and a student of the New Testament, you might be kind of wondering something in the back of your mind right now. So we're going to, we're going to take care of that, right? Because the question you might have is, how did the Sanhedrin, this is the Jewish Supreme Court, how did they have the authority here to charge and convict somebody of a capital offense? You, you know what I mean by that, right? Like, put the death penalty here. I mean, after all, why didn't they stone Jesus? They didn't have the authority to do so. They had to go to Pilate to get that done. And you might be like, well, how come they can do this with Stephen, but they couldn't do it with Jesus? Well, it's really, really quite simple. Stephen was a faithful servant of Christ, but he wasn't Jesus. Jesus had spent going on almost three years preaching, teaching the message of the kingdom. He had healed people. He'd done all of these amazing things for years now. And my goodness, he was known, well known. And if they had tried to take Jesus and stone him, oh, you're talking, you're talking a scene that they did not want and Rome would have come down hard. Stephen was an amazing man, but he was no Jesus. Another thing about that, history tells us from the works, not just of Scripture, but the works of Josephus, which are not Scripture, but they are history, tells us that Pilate could be relied upon to occasionally turn the blind eye, you know, and let the Jews kind of do their thing. And that's what they were doing here. Let's talk a little bit about this, this stoning. I'm going to give you some very specific instructions from the Mishnah. Now, the Mishnah was basically what the Jews of, of the late B.C., early A.D., that's the way they kind of took their lives, the practical aspects of the law as applied to their lives. It could also be called on some levels kind of the oral law because, because for the Israelites, it wasn't just enough to add to the law. They kind of or have the law, they would kind of add to it as well. You have the written law and the oral law. So when you have this Mishnah, it would give the instructions of how to go about certain things. And guess what? It has instructions on how to go about a stoning. And this actually comes from um, a Mishnah copy from the second century AD. So we're talking pretty close here in time frame. So it's probably pretty accurate. This is how it would take place. You got somebody charged with a capital offense. If they were charged and convicted, this is what happens next. You take them to the place where they are going to be stoned. You don't do it right there at the feet of the Sanhedrin. You take them out to get this done. When they are 10 cubits, listen, when they are 10 cubits away from this place where they are going to be stoned, the witness is given the opportunity to confess what they've done. Okay, after that, you go to four cubits from where the place where they will be stoned, and you strip them, remove their clothing. Okay, then you take them up to, it's either a ledge or kind of a pit, and you bring them up to the side of it. And the depth through which the, the, the criminal would fall would be about twice the height of the, average, of the average man. So you bring him up there to the edge, and then one of the witnesses, the first witness, if you will, one who witnessed against him at the trial, would come out while he's facing the ledge, the pit, and shove him in the back. And he would fall down onto his face. All right. What, what would happen next is you will go down into the pit. You go in there, and if that didn't kill him, if, if that killed him, that shove, then okay, the job's done. It's over and done with. If it did not kill the criminal, then you rolled them over on their back so that they were facing those who were above them with the stones. 
Okay. Next, the second witness who testified against them comes forward. They take a large stone and they drop it on the criminal's chest. And if that gets the job done and they die, it's over and done with. But if it doesn't, all who are there begin lobbing stones to kill the criminal. Okay, now here's something else that's very clear in the Mishnah. This is an extreme situation. If there is any legal loophole that can be found, there is no execution. Now let me ask you something. Do you think that mob scene of these infuriated people resemble anything like what's talked about in the Mishnah? Is it, a, is it a crowd of very solemn people of like, we really don't want to do this, but we have to do this? That's not really the scene that I'm seeing here. It is a very chaotic scene. As a matter of fact, some of the details we're going to get from it makes it clear they didn't follow anything that the Mishnah was talking about. As a matter of fact, it says at one point in time that Stephen fell to his knees. This is an ugly situation. And in the midst of all of this chaos and fury, we see something else taking place. Take a look at verse 59. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Now those words should sound a little familiar to us, but a little bit different. You remember what Jesus said on the cross? Some of his final words. He said, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. And he died. We have Stephen doing something similar. But who does he say these words to? To God the Father? No, he says them to his advocate. The one standing at the right hand of God the Father. And he cries out to his advocate, to his Christ, and he says, Lord, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Look what happens next. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. With his last words, Stephen, with his last words, he cries out for mercy, but not on his own behalf. He cries out for mercy to be shown the ones who are throwing the stones on top of him. An incredibly brutal situation. And this man has the wherewithal to ask God to show mercy on his murderers. And then Dr. Luke, the author, the Acts of the Apostles. He tells us these words, Stephen fell asleep. I love the words that he chooses to use here. It's an unexpectedly peaceful description in the face of such a brutal death. And I'm telling you something, brothers and sisters, when we see what Stephen does and the way he responds to these people, you're seeing, you're seeing the death here of a supremely confident man. I'll tell you something else. The first to lose his life for his faith in Jesus Christ. Stephen will always wear that title. 
And let me tell you something, brothers and sisters, because he's not the last. As a matter of fact, according to statistics, you can read all through it in the voice of the martyrs. From the time I've begun preaching this sermon, we've talked about this in the past, there have been people in our world who have lost their lives for their faith in Jesus Christ. It happens quite often. This is the first. And let me tell you something about him. My goodness, he set the bar kind of high, didn't he? <laughs> in the midst of everything he's going through, he remains calm and collected. I really don't think that God, through the Holy Spirit, gave him a pain-free experience. I don't know. Maybe he did. We can ask him one day. I just know this. His circumstances were not going to be his master. Jesus was. And here's the deal. The last thing he says is he begs for mercy for those who are killing him. He sets the bar high, and he shows us right here that, brothers and sisters, our response to trouble in this world, our response to persecution in this world, it matters. How did Stephen remain in control of himself throughout all of this? It's because of what's going on on the inside. That's how. He had full faith in his Lord. You think this made an impression on people? I mean, put yourself in the shoes of some of those throwing the stones. Would this, and, and, and you, just threw, you just threw the one that's probably going to get the job done, all right, and right before this man that you are throwing rocks at, he looks up into heaven and he begs God for your forgiveness. Is that going to make an impression on you? Look at the first verse, the next chapter. As I said, we've already had his name mentioned once, and here it is again. Chapter 8, verse 1. Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. Now, hindsight is twenty twenty. We know who Saul is, this Saul of Tarsus. Not too many months from then, his name would change. And his life would change. And we know him now as the Apostle Paul. Let me ask you a question. Where do you think Luke got all of these very specific details? I don't see anything in the text about Peter, James, and John being there. Do you? Where did Luke get all these very specific details? These details like his face looked like an angel. These details of him, what the words he said before he died. I mean, is it, is it the Holy Spirit he gave him that? Well, maybe partly, but I think probably somebody else. Luke makes it pretty clear when he writes his gospel and when he writes his account that we call Acts. That his testimony comes from eyewitnesses. Who's the eyewitness here? Saul. And let me tell you something, guys. That day made an impression on him. Now, don't get me wrong. Look at the rest of verse 8. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And that day... They were scattered, and they were scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. I mean, it's not like this changed, this changed Saul. No, it didn't, but he never forgot it. And we're going to read about the conversion of Saul before his name will be changed to Paul, before too long. And what we are going to see is this, this changed man, he never forgot Stephen. It's interesting what Paul, because Paul wrote a good chunk of, of what we have in the New Testament. And Paul calls himself a number of different things. He calls himself a, a servant of Christ. And that's kind of a tamed down version. He actually calls himself a slave of Christ. 
okay? He calls him a messenger of Christ. He calls himself an apostle. He calls himself a chosen instrument of God to bring the message of salvation to the Gentiles. He calls himself a lot of different things. You know one of them that stands out that he calls himself? Chief of all sinners. And then he goes on to explain why. Because I persecuted the church. I think if we were to have him go a little further into that, he would say, I watched Stephen die. And I welcomed the scene. Therefore, Paul speaking, when you see me, you see the chief of all sinners. Let me ask you something, brothers and sisters. If Paul could not only be forgiven, but used in such a mighty way by God, what does that say about us? Now, don't get me wrong. I mean, Paul was an apostle, okay? A capital A apostle. And that that puts him kind of on a level. But Paul was also someone that God used. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. Sometimes we can get so messed up in our our little brains up here, all right, that we think we are not worthy to do something for the Lord. This happens amongst believers. I don't know if you've experienced it. I hope not, but I'd be willing to bet there's somebody in this room that has. It's like, no, that's not for me. That's, That's for somebody else. You don't know where I came from. You don't know what I've done. Well, I've got a feeling that nobody here participated. Now, I could be wrong, but participated in the execution of Christians. If you've done that, I don't know if you should raise your hand. Talk to me about it after church, and we'll figure something out, okay? But I'm guessing that hasn't taken place for the majority of us in this room. But let me tell you something. Paul isn't the last one that will be a part of an event like that that would later become a proclaimer of Jesus Christ. And if God can use people... You know what, you know what Paul would be called if he was around today? He was, he'd still be Saul at that point in time, okay? He was going around, as we will see in the next chapter, breathing murderous threats against anybody bearing the name of Jesus Christ. You know what we would call a religious fanatic like that? A terrorist. And God took a terrorist and turned him to one of his most powerful messengers of all time. A co-author along with God of much of our New Testament. Are you telling me God can't use you if he can use a terrorist? We come to our time of communion. We come for some very specific reasons, one in particular. We come giving thanks to God for what he's done for us. You know why Paul could be forgiven? Paul, who shed the blood of others, he could be forgiven because Christ shed his blood for him. Christ shed his blood for you and for me. God shed his blood for you and for me. And for that, I don't think we could ever say thank you enough. And when we come to our time of communion, that is the primary thing we do. We thank Jesus for his blood. But we also thank Jesus for the hope we have 
because he conquered the grave. And just like he arose, brothers and sisters, so will we. When we come to communion, we thank him for that. Let's do that today. JB already covered this. I'll mention it very, very quickly. We practice an open communion here. If you're a baptized believer in Christ Jesus, you're welcome to share. If you didn't grab one of those cups when you came in, after I pray, just raise your hand and Keith will bring one to you. Give you a little bit of time to say thank you to God. Then I'll come back up and I'll close this in prayer. Let's get our minds where they need to be. Let's thank God for what he's done for us. Okay, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much, so much, Lord, for all that you have done for us. We thank you for the shed blood of Jesus Christ. We thank you that our Savior is also our Lord and our advocate in your presence. And we can have hope because he lives. Father, we thank you that that your Son, our Savior, speaks on our behalf before you. All the time. And Lord, we pray you would give us the courage, the conviction, Lord, to witness for you before the world like Jesus Christ witnessed in the throne room of heaven before our Father. Thank you so much for the hope before us. Thank you that Jesus is coming again. We pray all this in his name. Amen. Don't you stand with me?
You know, um, as we close things down today, the thing that, that we need that we need very much to, to keep in mind um, is is the fact uh, that perspective is is capable of changing everything. Okay, and what I mean by that is is what we experience in this world because we know. I mean, if we if you've been walking around long enough for a while now, a couple couple two three four decades. Right, you you you've come to an understanding that that life can be can be pretty tough sometimes, and some of you have experienced that to a level that I I I haven't. All right, and when we go through those times, whether it comes from, as I said, just just difficulty in life, or whether it comes from truly truly being persecuted for your faith in Jesus Christ, because it does happen. Even in this nation, it, it happens, okay? But the way, the way to, to keep the proper perspective in the midst of all of that is to understand, brothers and sisters, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this world's not your home. It's not our home. I really honestly think that, that the 20th century writer and author C.S. Lewis put it in a way I haven't seen anybody else other than Scripture put it better. When he talks about difficulty, when he talks about pain, when he talks about opposition in this world, and he says this, he says, God, the Father, the loving Father, He whispers, you understand? He whispers in our hearts and minds and in our lives through pleasures that we experience in this world. He whispers. But he shouts at us through our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. You understand the significance of that? It is a reminder that this world, for the believers of Jesus Christ, for the followers of Jesus Christ, it's not just a megaphone to awaken us to God and his presence and his existence because we already know he's there. For us, it is a reminder that we're not home yet, okay? And while we are here, there will be trouble. And you know what? Now the New Testament kicks in, which as much as I love C.S. Lewis, he doesn't hold a candle to the New Testament, all right? Or the Old Testament for that matter. And when you look at the New Testament specifically, when it begins to talk about, there's kind of this change there. You see trouble in the Old Testament? You see trouble in the New Testament? In the Old Testament, it was like, what did you do wrong? What did you do wrong? What did you do wrong? You mean Job and his buddies? Job's like, I didn't do anything wrong, guys. He was getting angry about it, okay? To the point that he was shaking his fist at God. Well, God showed up at the end, and Job got a lesson in humility, all right? But you, you fast forward a few centuries into the New Testament, and the writers of the New Testament, one of which is that guy that we talked about today, the Apostle Paul, and they begin to speak about trouble in this world in an entirely different way. They don't talk about deserving it or brought it upon ourselves. They begin saying this, rejoice in it. And I was like, come again? Rejoice in it. Father disciplines those whom he loves. And difficulty in this world is a drastic reminder. This world isn't home. But brothers and sisters, we're here for a while. And the way we respond to difficulty in life, yes, it does matter. But you know what else matters? Truth matters. There is absolute truth. There is, and at the center of all of it is Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. That's the truth. And we are to present the truth while we're here. There's no option, people. There is no, well, I don't have the spiritual gift of presenting truth. No, 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 no. Stephen did it well, and he was full of the Holy Spirit, but I'm not sure he had the gift for it. 
He did it because of the supreme confidence that lived inside of him that his God is faithful. No matter what. Now, here's the thing. As those guys are heaping stones on his head, he asks God for mercy for them. And guess what? One of the guys standing there while they're throwing the stones, got a little something to say about that later in life. When he says this, presenting the truth in love. So it's not only our responsibility to bring the truth to people who need to hear it. We are to do it with a heart of compassion. And now we're beginning to see why we need the spirit in this life, brothers and sisters, because we can't do it of our own. We just can't. Jesus is coming soon, folks. I don't know what that means. I don't know if that means tomorrow, or I don't mean know if that means 500 years from now. I, I don't know, but I, I, I know this. It could be tomorrow. What are we doing about it? One last question before we close down. If you are in this room right now and you are not a follower of Jesus Christ, this is the truth. Spoken in love. Your future is a future of eternal judgment and punishment. God love you? Yes, he loves you. But in your present condition, you can't handle him. His righteousness would destroy you. Your only hope It's the blood of Jesus Christ who loved you so much personally, he died on your behalf. If you have never relinquished the control of your life to Jesus Christ, my question is why and what are you waiting for? There are so many people in this room who would love to talk to you about what it means to turn your life over to Jesus. Don't wait. One day it will be too late. Okay? Do it today. All right, let's pray. Father, we come before you. We thank you so much, Lord, for Stephen's example that we can be encouraged by, Lord, and we can learn from. But Lord, we know that the reason he was so confident is because he was such a, such a powerful individual. It's because he had and has a powerful Lord. Father, we pray for brothers and sisters in Christ throughout this world who are experiencing persecution to such a level that giving their life is a very real possibility. We pray, Father, that they would be strong in the face of persecution and that they, like Stephen, would continue to love their persecutors. Even when life gets unbearably hard. We pray, Father, for us, that you would give us the, the, the opportunities and the strength by your Spirit to represent you well in this world. Lord, may we be confident men and women because we can stand firm in your faithfulness, Lord. I pray that we will represent you well this week. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, church. Have a great week. Be praying for those kiddos out at camp, okay? Be safe this far and grace will lead me home. Grace will lead me home.